respected members of the faculty, uh, dear students, legal practitioners. Thank you so very much for inviting me to this August Forum to express my thoughts over the book. The book was presented to me by Ikramullah Saab about a month ago and I have had the privilege of going through it and my thoughts over it undoubtedly is that it is the best book in Pakistan on the law of arbitration. I urge earnestly all of you to read it, to understand it. You use it as a handbook as far as practitioners are concerned and use it for the preparation of your exams. It is an elaboration of not just every section of the law of arbitration in Pakistan, but the reader's thought. And as my Lord Justice Jawad Hassan said, it is backed by the precedent law of Pakistan only. You do not have to go across the border or venture into other territories to find precedents. The law has been so exhaustively interpreted by our courts that you have to only confine yourself to your territory. Uh, the law of arbitration has a very rich heritage and it is of an ancient lineage in the subcontinent. It has existed in the form of Panjayat system and the Jirga system. But in a statutory form, it first came in 15, uh, sorry, in 1858 when the first Code of Civil Procedure came. That primarily dealt with arbitration in pending suits. And it was not until 1899 that the Arbitration <laughs> Act was enacted for the North or for the subcontinent. Because there were these two statutes dealing with it, and it was not in a codified form, the Civil Justices Committee in 1924 gave a critique as to the existing form of the law of arbitration in the subcontinent. And a recommendation was made to have one codified law. <laughs> and it was not until 1940 that the Arbitration Act was enacted. Now, before we go into the provisions of the Arbitration Act 1940, another development on the law of arbitration had taken place prior to that. In 19 24, British India, as part of the British Empire, was signatory to the Geneva Convention. It was the protocol on the enforcement of foreign arbitration awards and recognition of arbitration agreements providing for foreign arbitration. 1937 gave that convention the force of law. Pakistan has a system whereby it can enter into treaties. The state enters into treaties or conventions. But unlike the United States, the mere fact that they have entered into treaties does not make the provisions of those treaties a part of the law of Pakistan until a process which is known as domesticization that takes place. What is domesticization? That is when there is law enacted by parliament giving recognition to the provisions of the treaty or the convention. It may choose to give recognition to it in its entirety or a part of it. And in 1937 recognition was accorded to the Geneva Convention and that is how it became the law of, in those days, British India and after 1947 as part of the law of Pakistan. The 
pivotal question as to whether the arbitration award is a foreign award or a domestic award was to be dependent on what is the law governing the arbitration. If the arbitration clause provides for a governing law provision, then it is that clause that prevails. But if it, there isn't, then the governing law of the arbitration agreement in which the arbitration clause is embodied, that will govern the arbitration. As practitioners, to defeat the purpose of arbitration, we found quite simple. The reason why we say that is because various provisions of the Arbitration Act could be subjected to misinterpretation. What is the purpose of arbitration? It is essentially a time-saving device, an expense-saving device. Litigants avoid going to the courts and subjecting themselves to very lengthy litigations, especially by a court which is not an expert in certain technical matters. For instance, there will hardly be a commercial contract that you will find today which will not have an arbitration clause. Construction contracts, for example, it will not just have an arbitration clause, but in an entire machinery as to how that arbitration is to culminate in the form of an award. You do not have to be a lawyer or well-versed in legal scriptures in order to become an arbitrator. The purpose of arbitration is to bring in expert views. You may have an expert in a certain field, like a doctor, a surgeon, a contractor even. To become an arbitrator, he will bring forth his own knowledge of, and his technical expertise and put it in the form of an award. You do not have to be a lawyer. The proceedings before the arbitrator need not be like a trial. You need not file a statement of claim. You need not file a defense or issues to be framed. There is no requirement for that. The arbitrator regulates its own procedure. I recall more than 20 years ago, I once sat as an arbitrator in a dispute between the World Food Program and the transporter of food aid to Afghanistan. And we agreed for there to be no recording of evidence, no production of documents, because everything was admitted. Straight away we went into arguments and an arbitration award was rendered. There is no harm in that because the arbitrator regulates its own procedure. Unfortunately, the manner in which the law of arbitration has been interpreted has made lawyers laugh and the legal philosophers weep. Because instead of it becoming a time-saving device, an expense-saving device, it has become extremely time-consuming. Like Justice Jawad Hassan said, once we come onto the bench, there is a very big burden on our shoulders. And the burden that we, in the law of arbitration, have primarily tried to discharge is to interpret every provision of it in such a manner as to achieve its intended purpose, that is saving of time, and for it to be less expensive. For instance, there are three forms of arbitration. One of the form is arbitration with the intervention of the court. That experience has told us is the most time consuming of the three options. You file an application under Section 20 of the Arbitration Act. Section 20 provides that it has to be numbered and registered as a suit. The numbering and the registration is only a ministerial requirement for registration purposes, a clerical requirement. But it is misinterpreted by treating it like a suit by calling for a written statement and giving opportunities after opportunities to file written statements and after that going into arguments. We have held that an application under Section 20 of the Arbitration Act 
the court only has to see if the four essential conditions are satisfied. Whether there's an agreement between the parties that contains an arbitration clause, whether that agreement was entered into before the application was filed, whether the court has pecuniary and territorial jurisdiction over the matter, and whether there is a dispute between the parties which is covered by the arbitration clause. For this, adjournment after adjournment must never be granted. These matters can be decided in one date of hearing. And the law says that the opposing party, the party that is required to show cause as to why the matter should not be referred to arbitration. So there is no requirement to file a reply but to show cause as to why the matter should not be referred to arbitration. If on the next date of hearing, cause, sufficient cause is not shown for referring the matter to arbitration, send it to arbitration. Appoint the arbitrator which the court thinks is going to impartially determine the dispute and also has the expertise to decide that. The second form of arbitration is arbitration without the intervention of the court, where the parties do not resort to the court to refer the matter to arbitration, but outside the court, an arbitration process starts. This is most commonly resorted to in developed countries, and it is developing now in Pakistan also. But for arbitration without the intervention of the court, the opposing party's consent is required at every stage of the proceedings. For instance, where one arbitrator is to be appointed, the parties have to agree on that one party. Warring parties who are in such bitter dispute with each other normally do not agree on one person to be appointed as the arbitrator. Therefore, Section 8 of the Arbitration Act gives the power to the court to appoint an arbitrator. Now, the court under Section 8 only has the power to appoint an arbitrator. But unfortunately, the courts over here will appoint the arbitrator and give a direction to the arbitrator to decide the matter in four months and to produce the arbitration award before him. This is totally without <coughs> jurisdiction. So there is a problem in understanding this special law. Another problem that arises is where there is a two-member arbitral tribunal. One party will appoint its arbitrator, the other party would want to thwart the proceedings or delay the proceedings. So it does not appoint its arbitrator. There section 9 gives you a solution where you can give a notice and in 15 days if the second arbitrator is not appointed, your appointed sole arbitrator will sit as an arbitrator and decide the matter. So if you look at the law and you interpret it purposefully, you will find no flaw in it. It is just that the manner in which it has been interpreted has made arbitration into a very cumbersome affair. Normally, parties avoid the arbitration clause by instituting a suit. What happens then? Parties have agreed to resolve their disputes through arbitration, but one of them has filed a suit. You must remember that arbitration is a term of a contract. It is a contract between the parties. And the courts must strive to uphold the contract between the parties, must not let the parties renege from their contract. So when one party files a suit in the presence of an arbitration clause, the other party will have a right whether to continue with that suit because that is his then implied consent not to ask for arbitration or to insist and file an application in the court saying, please stop the proceedings. You do not have the jurisdiction to decide this case on merits because there is an arbitration clause between the parties. Now, access to justice is a fundamental right. Access to the courts is a fundamental right. You exercise that fundamental right by filing a suit. Section 9 of the Code of Civil Procedure gives you that right. Now, does one party, when it insists that resort to arbitration should be made and a suit should not be filed. Is this in restraint of legal proceedings? Section 28 of the Contract Act says 
that no contract in restraint of legal proceedings is valid. But that law has an exception. And the only exception to that is where there is an arbitration clause in the agreement. Section 21 of the Specific Relief Act. If one party enters into a contract with an arbitration clause and then challenges it, Section 21 prohibits that. The reason why it prohibits it, because Section 21 was amended in 1940 when the Arbitration Act of 1940 was enacted. The reason why it prohibits that is because the Arbitration Act also provides for a machinery where you can challenge the agreement which contains the arbitration clause or the arbitration clause. Section 35 of the Arbitration Act deals with that. My Lord spoke of the word misconduct. Misconduct of an arbitrator is one of the grounds on which an arbitration award can be set aside. Once the arbitration proceedings culminate in the award, in Pakistan, we have the Arbitration Act 1940. And Section 3 of that Act makes the implied provisions which are set out in the schedule to the Arbitration Act as a part of the contract. One of those implied provisions is that the arbitration award is final and binding between the parties. So parties are bound by the arbitration award. But if you want to have the arbitration award enforced, what do you do? How can you compel the other party to the arbitration proceedings to act in accordance with the award? You can issue him a notice, but he may not respond. Therefore, the Arbitration Act provides you with the remedy to file that award in the court and pray for a judgment and decree to be passed in terms of the award. Once a judgment and decree in terms of the award is filed, is passed, it will have the same force as any other judgment and decree of a court. And it will also be appealable under Section 39 of the Arbitration Act to a court empowered to hear appeals from decrees. So there is a mechanism provided in the Arbitration Act in order to enforce an arbitration award. Once it is made a rule of court and a judgment in decree in terms of that arbitration award is filed. But an arbitration award by itself is not sacrosanct. There is a mechanism provided where you can challenge an arbitration award. But in that mechanism, the courts must be careful that they should not sit over such a challenge like a court of appeal. It cannot rehear the case. It cannot substitute its own findings for those of the arbitrator. And there's a very narrow keyhole through which the award has to be scrutinized. There has to be an error apparent on the surface of the award. You have to see as to whether the arbitrator has misconducted himself. Now, going back to the word misconduct, it is in, in the arbitration parallance, the, the word misconduct is not to be treated like the normal understanding of the word. People are dismissed from service due to misconduct. Now, judges of the High Court, judge, the retired judges of the Supreme Court, they sit as arbitrators. Now, the mere fact that a judge sits as an arbitrator, would that by itself make the arbitration award immune from challenge? No, because the law provides the remedy to the other side to challenge it on the ground of misconduct. Now, are you alleging misconduct against a retired judge? Does that not sound strange? But no, in arbitration law, in the arbitration parallels, the term misconduct has been interpreted to mean only that the arbitrator has not followed the law. He has not appreciated the evidence. He has committed an error of jurisdiction. This is the ground on which you can challenge the arbitration award and have it struck down on the ground of misconduct. It does not in any manner cast any aspersion 
on the arbitrator who renders the arbitration award. So therefore, an arbitration award is not immune from challenge. What we have noticed is that this law that is laid down by the superior courts that you will not hear a challenge to the arbitration award like you are hearing an appeal. This has caused the court which is deciding whether or not to set aside the award to put its pen down. There is an obligation on the court to scrutinize the award. There is also the requirement of the law that not just the arbitration award is to be filed in the court, but also the record of the arbitration proceedings has to be filed on the court. For what purpose? For this purpose, to see as to whether the arbitration award is in accordance with the evidence or not. This is an error of law that will go to the root of the case if a material evidence has been missed. And if it has been missed, one can safely say that the arbitrator has misconducted the proceedings. And it will be a ground to set aside an award. The omission by the court of first instance to scrutinize the award in this very manner in which I have mentioned puts a much bigger obligation on the appellate court because the, an appeal is a continuation of the proceedings and the appellate court is then bound to examine the matter and you will find umpteen judgments of the high courts, especially the Lahore High Court, Islamabad High Court, where arbitration awards have been set aside because the appellate court comes to the conclusion that the award is invalid. You will also find judgments of uh, the high courts in which the arbitration awards given by retired judges of the Supreme Court have been set aside. That is because the term misconduct as interpreted in the parallance has been found to exist as far as the proceedings are concerned. Now, I want to constrain myself because the subject of arbitration is very wide. We can go on and on about it. But all that I'm saying is that what I've said to you is so well documented in this book that it is a license for every practitioner in the law of arbitration to be successful. So therefore, Mr. Ikramullah Khan, we thank you very much for this contribution to the jurisprudence and the development of the law. Thank you. Sir.